Okay. All right, so uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, for those of you who do not know who I am, my name is uh, Elwin, and for a living, I code for the Singapore government. Uh, over the next 10 to 15, 10 to 15 minutes or so, uh, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about my uh, career as a developer, including uh, the time when people realized I was a little bit more senior than the others and decided that I should be doing uh, a little bit more non-coding uh, responsibilities. Like. And uh, I'll also talk about like why I still want to keep uh, coding even though I've got these newfound responsibilities and hopefully that might explain why I decided to scratch out the first part of my, uh, of my title. So um, a bit of background of myself, uh, I have been coding for about the better part of a decade and a bit now. Uh, most of my time has been spent uh, working for the investment banks, uh, working on like uh, large scale uh, trading systems and that sort of thing. Uh, in more recent times, uh, I transitioned to the public service. I now work for GovTech Singapore. Uh, and that was the point where I basically uh, started assuming more uh, non-coding responsibilities. Uh, we'll, get, we'll get to that in a bit. Uh, but first, maybe I'll, I'll take you back to the time when I first started out. So I joined a large US investment bank uh, around 2008, uh, deep in the middle of the, uh, of the subprime financial crisis. It was a time where there was a lot of change going on due to uh, markets evolving in response to the crisis as well as uh, demands being, uh, regulatory demands being put out by the various uh, fin financial authorities. Uh, and it was quite tense for everybody involved, but it was also a great learning opportunity because there was a lot more things to build now. And uh, you know, I took advantage of that. So I, uh, there was, uh, I built a lot of things actually, um, from simple CRUD apps that stored uh, meter data about the systems that we had in the bank to um, business rules engines that kind of consumed large amounts of market data and uh, later on I started playing around with uh, Hazelcast which is a clustered uh, in-memory uh, in data, uh, database uh, which was used as a key value pair store. So that was great uh, and on top of that uh, the bank I was working for was, uh, was a company that saw technology that uh, could either create new capabilities for them to serve their clients or to enhance their uh, pre-existing capabilities. And uh, as a result of that, they invested a lot of, um, uh, of money and time into actually building out our, our tech infrastructure. So uh, everything was well organized. Uh, and uh, on top of that, I, uh, there was an environment to learn. There, not only was there formalized uh, training courses, there was also informal meetups for, uh, for the developers to come together to, uh, to discuss and exchange ideas. So, all that was great. Um, I, I felt I was learning a lot, building a lot, practice, uh, practicing coding, and, um, and, and basically growing as a, as a professional. So that was all great, except for one particular thing. There were a lot of senior uh, managers uh, that I saw around me who were very uh, dull, very miserable, very sad. Um, a lot of them used to be uh, competent coders in their own right uh, when they first started out. But then over time, uh, the only development environment they were familiar with was Microsoft Outlook. So if they were not sending emails, they were going to meetings. If they're not going to meetings, they were answering emails in relation to arranging meetings. And um, the only time you actually saw their faces light up was when you go up to them and say, yeah, um, there's this system you wrote 20 years ago that uh, nobody knows how to, uh, how to fix and it's broken in production and only you know how to fix it. Uh, at which point they was like, oh, cool. I can actually fix that thing. I'll fix it. Just, just stay there. Let me write. Let me implement the patch. Let me write the patch. I'll give it to you, and we go patch production, and then we'll all be on our merry way, right? And once that's all done, then they return to their old gray, miserable selves, and 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 return to Microsoft Outlook. <laughs> no hate on Microsoft Outlook, I guess. Um, so it kind of concerned me enough as a developer to actually uh, to actually ask around about what my uh, what my career progression is going to be. And uh, I think this might be a sentiment that might be, uh, that might be shared amongst the more senior developers uh, amongst us, right? Uh, as, we, uh, as we progress over time, uh, it's inevitable that you might actually have to take on more administrative roles, more mentoring roles, and that would cut into your coding time. Lah. There were, in that particular institution, there were some exceptions. There were some senior people who, who had been with the firm 20 years and were still working on technical stuff, but they were more the exception than the norm. Uh, the catchphrase "management is inevitable" was uh, was told uh, was was told me like. So um, it did concern me for a bit, but you know I was young, I was indestruct fairly indestructible, and um, I just got, continued my merry way like. And uh, over the years, kept working for the banks until I decided to join uh, GovTech. Now, uh, one of the first few things that uh, I was told when uh, um, 
uh, when, uh, when I started working for, uh, for the government was that I was going to stop working in Java and to start working in a completely new language, uh, JavaScript. Now, the names might be similar, but they couldn't be more different from each other, right? Java is this very verbose uh, language which dealt uh, a lot with, uh, with types, uh, with a very long bootstrap time, with, uh, with, uh, which, gave, which gave you a lot of control over very low level things like, like threading and concurrency. JavaScript, completely different thing altogether. Uh, very concise as a language relative to Java anyway. Uh, and uh, very limited in terms of how you can control, uh, uh, control the low level stuff. So um, it kind of concerned me a bit for, uh, for, um, at first because I kind of built up uh, quite a fair amount of experience working with Java and now I'm kind of being asked to throw all this away and uh, use a new language, right? And when you kind of, and given the fact that Java is still quite prevalent in industry, when you, uh, you know, there's always the worry that you throw all that away, start working on something and then you wish to return to work, uh, to work on Java only to find that you know, your skills were no longer as relevant as it used to be. So, um, and there's, there's always also the risk that I might not be able to keep up at, uh, uh, learning, uh, learning JavaScript compared to everybody else. Um, because, you know, you get older, your learning capabilities may not be, uh, you may not be so nimble in terms of learning, uh, learning new things. But, you know, maybe the language change wasn't a bad thing. It's not like I'll be throwing away all my lessons. There were some things I learned in Java which will still be applicable to JavaScript. Like things like uh, being mindful of uh, how you design your programs uh, for instance, or how you go about debugging an application. Uh, and some of the things that I've kind of learned in Java may not be so relevant today. Like, I can't remember the last time I actually had to worry about uh, multi-threading and concurrency. So, um, you know, overall, it was still an opportunity to, opportunity to, <laughs> opportunity to learn, right? Uh, it, it, and this was my uh, uh, inroad for me to go uh, take part in a growing and a vibrant uh, ecosystem. So. Um, you know, without, uh, without much further delay, I decided, fine, I'll just keep contributing as a senior software engineer within, uh, within GovTech, still coding, still learning new things and making significant contributions. And then I was told, uh, you are going to cut back on your coding activity and actually start doing more mentoring instead. Right. And uh, at that point, I was like, oh, okay, well, that's cool. Uh, at the back, I, I was really worried because I did enjoy coding a lot as a uh, as uh, as my day job, and um, you know now now with the responsibilities to mentor people, that's going to cut into my coding time, and um, you know a part of me didn't want to lose the ability to code or all the all the fact uh, all uh, even coding uh, as an activity, and uh, because if I if that happens, then I wouldn't be able to enjoy what I do. If I get out of touch with coding, it may not even, uh, I may not be effective even as a, a mentor to the other junior developers and uh, or even be uh, capable as a senior staff within a technology organization. I mean, come on, right? You're a senior staff, you're in a technology organization and you don't know anything technical. I mean, something, something's quite wrong there. Uh, and in the back of my mind, I didn't want to end up like those miserable senior managers I saw, I saw early on in my career. So um, I kind of realized that I had to keep coding somehow, right? Um, I have to uh, moreover justify to my superiors that uh, whatever I am doing in relation to my coding activity is not going to impinge on my, on my other responsibilities. So uh, with that in mind, my coding activity will have to be somehow short and very bursty, uh, which would probably make it good for just very small pieces of functionality within uh, and self-contained projects. Or in other words, I'm going to have to become a junior developer again. Right. So there were two broad avenues uh, through which I was able to uh, to do this to help me keep uh, to keep coding, so uh, the open source ecosystem turned out to be a, a surprisingly fertile ground for me to keep uh, to to keep practice, uh, practicing and that sort of thing. Uh, and I mean, suffice to say, GitHub has uh, managed to uh, facilitate collaboration between developers at a at a level that we have never been able to see before. Uh, typically, your work interaction with the open source ecosystem is uh, you have a work uh, your your work system has a dependency on an open source library, it's broken or it's missing a feature, uh, you get frustrated because the maintainers are somehow missing or don't have the time to actually work on it, so you actually decide to uh, make a pull request your, uh, yourself. Uh, I kind of went one step uh, above the, um, beyond that, so even, even, if, uh, even after I've submitted the fix or the, uh, or the feature, uh, feature request that I, uh, that I wanted, I, I lingered around, I continued to, uh, to maintain the code somehow, um, 
And so the open source library maintainers, they tend to be quite appreciative of that because they themselves tend to be a bit busy. They have, they have their own life, uh, life to live. And you know, if there are more people who are around to actually uh, contribute to the development of, uh, of the library, that's great. Uh, that means everybody, everybody wins as a result. So um, in, uh, for, for my part, it kind of allowed me to uh, keep practicing uh, in the form of like reading a code base that which I've never uh, encountered before to uh, try to understand it in context and to interact with, uh, with other developers who are not my colleagues. So in, uh, in other words, they start to I interact with them as a peer or, as a, or even as a subordinate, depending on, on what the hierarchy is like. Uh, so it's kind of like working on a small part of a larger code base uh, with its own upstream and downstream uh, dependencies. Um, of course, there's one drawback. Uh, it's going to be very hard to justify trying to do this during work hours, especially after your your dev request, uh, your own uh, your own work needs are done. So uh, you will end, end up having to uh, spend a lot of time outside of work trying to do these things. And I think for many of us, we do have lives outside of coding. So uh, you know, it it's a bit it's it's a bit a big of an ask to try to try to contribute to open source. But still, I think there are benefits to be had. Uh, this is a conversation I had with, uh, with the author of uh, the NPM package XML Crypto. Uh, as the name suggests, it provides uh, cryptographic signatures for XML documents. Um, nobody, actually, uh, nobody was actually actively maintaining this library because nobody really does XML with Node.js. Everybody uses JSON, right? Um, but uh, FormSG, actually uh, FormSG, which is the government form builder, we kind of need to use this because we interacted quite uh, quite in, uh, extensively with SingPass and CodePass, and uh, they they are basically uh, a soap based service, which meant XML messages being pa passed back and forth. So, uh, you know, it's quite satisfying that uh, that you know we are, that the changes I've, I've been putting in actually benefited people around me, and that uh, people actually are appreciative of uh, of what you do uh, to to the, uh, to the library. So that's uh, open source. I'm going to talk about uh, another approach, spin-offs. That kind of uh, involves either partitioning a, code, uh, a part of the code base uh, into its own standalone project or standalone system or standalone library or whatnot, or you, just, or you create something that kind of complements the, uh, the code base that you're kind of working on. Um, that's kind of more easily justifiable than, than spending time on open source uh, contributions uh, for a, a couple of reasons. Lah. Um, so one of them is that if you're sharding out code from the main code base, uh, the original code base is a lot more focused. So it's actually working on the things that uh, you've, uh, that uh, it's actually trying to solve the problem that that the, uh, that the main code base is trying to solve. If your uh, if your superiors kind of ask you why are you spending all this time trying to be uh, trying to code and like separate out code or building new things to complement the original code base, uh, you just the the usual comeback I would usually use is. I'm not really coding. I'm actually trying to organize things and trying to facilitate, uh, f f facilitate um, the work of my colleagues so that they can be more effective at their job, and that usually, uh, that usually sits well with them. And uh, in the meantime, uh, by um, by doing all this, I'm actually, uh, I'm actually killing two birds in one stone because uh, I, I get to be a junior developer again, uh, but this time on a small, smaller, self-contained project. So. Um, and I think one of the prime examples of this within uh, our own, uh, within uh, GovTech's Open Government Products Group, where I work in, is uh, the was Mock Pass. Um, so this was basically built by myself so that I could help my colleagues working on Form SG to uh, to interact uh, to to build their functionality around SingPass and CodePass without actually having to connect to SingPass and CodePass. And the reason why we had to do that was because uh, setting up SingPass and CodePass on your local dev machine is very tedious and uh, also meant that any, any, uh, anything that you wanted to test on your dev laptop required connection, uh, con connectivity with SingPass and CodePass. And that's not something that we can always guarantee. So by providing mock pass, we can actually have a more, um, a more consistent uh, dev testing experience. I can keep talking about it, uh, but I, if you want to find out more, just use the QR code to, uh, to go find the article or just go to blog.data.gov.sg and uh, click on uh, click on the on the latest article, um, and can read more about uh, about that. So that's kind of um, everything that I have to I have to say about this topic. Uh, and I, I hope that I've been able to impress upon you that uh, as you get as you uh, as you get more senior as a uh, as a software engineer, 
uh, technological change and uh, management responsibilities, those are inevitable. That will be a, a, a part of your day-to-day -day work, but there will be ways around, uh, around managing that as well as your own coding activity. And uh, hopefully, when you're asked to step up in, uh, step up in terms of seniority, uh, you will still have the means to keep coding, both for your own benefit and that of your teams. Thanks for your time. Uh, I'll be around for questions.